Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. So I have a terrific show on deck for you. I am going to examine the bipartisan Safer Communities Bill that passed in July of 2022, and specifically the biggest impacts that bill will have on school safety. And there's a lot of kind of surprising things that came out of that bill, some things that actually don't make sense. So we're going to go through that today. I'm also going to do a video compare and contrast of the new schoolsafety.gov website, which is meant to be a clearinghouse for school safety for typically schools to access different resources, guides, templates, uh, professional development. So we're going to have access to that. You're going to see that. I'm going to compare that then to the previous or existing, I'm not sure, um, clearinghouse, which is REMS TA. So we're going to go side by side. You're going to get to see what the new one looks like, what the old one looks like. I say old in quotes because I'm not sure that the REMS one is has been retired or if we're going to have two clearing houses and we'll get into that. Um, and I'm going to then talk about some of the other updates in school safety this summer, including uh, where we stand with policies state by state for schools, for example, uh, locking doors. Is it a must lock doors? Is it a should lock doors? What does the language look like that's out there? So uh, let's get into it. We have the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. So this passed in summer. Um, I guess we could call this gun legislation, although I'm not sure that Again, what's in here is there are components of this. Let's go through it. Okay. Per everytown.org, the bill purportedly enhances background checks for buyers under 21. So that would be 18 year olds. Uh, in schools, schools serve students ages 3 through 21. So an 18 year old typically would be a senior, um, a student with a disability could stay in school till they're 21. So it does add for um, high school students who would be able to legally of age to obtain a, a gun. This would deepen the background check. What that means, I'm not sure. It would support state red flag laws. It would disarm domestic abusers, clarify who must run a background check, crack down on gun trafficking, fund community violence intervention, invest in mental health services, and provide school safety funding. Okay, so that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, and so this again is largely the result of the Uvalde school shooting and probably a cumulative of uh, you know school shootings that happened in 2022 as the impetus to have this, this bill passed. So um, again, we have a lot of things like crack down on gun trafficking, not sure exactly what that means and, and how that will manifest. Community violence intervention, uh, mental health. So we see uh, billions of dollars now going into mental health. You know, when I wrote School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety America, right here, folks, when I wrote this book, um, when this released in 2019, school safety was a $3 billion industry. And now if we look at the dollars that are going into mental health aspects of school and additional fortifications, and, and it's really getting closer to a five or $6 billion industry. And by the way, this book, this is the paperback version, is available for $20 on Amazon and places that sell books. And the audiobook version of School of Airs is now available on Audible and a number of other audio uh, distributor and retailer websites, including libraries. So you can check with your library if they have the audiobook version, which I narrated. It's six hours long of School of Errors that released 
August 1st of 2022. And if they don't have it, say, hey, could you get this? There's a special right now through the end of August for libraries to purchase that book, I think, for $11.99, which then includes um, the, the checkouts. Uh, so it's really a great deal for uh, libraries to be, be adding that. But that's, that's as simple as emailing or stopping in at your local library and saying, hey, there's this, this audio book. The library probably already has the print book or access to it. Can you add the audio? So, yeah, you know, what, what does this all mean? So let's look at the first part of this, and that's the creation of a school safety clearinghouse website. The thought being that schools don't know where to go to to get uh, guides about how to do a threat assessment, um, templates for investigating risk, uh, activities such as tabletop activities, how to do those, and job descriptions for different safety positions. I mean, all of that, right? That's That that would be need to be centralized somewhere, that schools don't know where to get this. The federal government puts these things out there. It's up to the states then to typically implement them, or the states put their own flavor into it. And a lot of states will pass that right down to the districts to do what needs to be done in that local district context. So this whole thought of, of having this clearinghouse, um, I, don't, I, I, I don't understand it for the reason that there is already a clearinghouse for school safety. It's readiness and emergency uh, management or REMS, T-A-R-E-M-S dot E-D dot gov. So you're going to see that here in just a second. I'm going to introduce you to it. Now, this site, it has been around uh, for several years. I've been uh, featuring this when I instruct aspiring school leaders. You know, here is a, a clearinghouse site that also has where you can um, access trainings where they'll uh, REMS folks will conduct virtual trainings or they'll come right to your school district and conduct uh, a training such as uh, site assessment for safety and so forth. It's all on, on their webpage. We'll go through it again in a little bit. So this REMS TA site was robust and it was current. But one thing I found when I would talk with administrators at the start of the year is, has anybody seen this? Has anybody heard about this? Do you use this as a resource? And they'd say no. So, you know, that might be 30 students who say, I've never heard about this. And you should, right? By the time you're a first year superintendent or, or principal. So part of it is this was never promoted. You just kind of found it. And that's how I discovered it. I didn't know that REMS TA existed until a parent contacted me and said, hey, this is a terrific site. And then I did a little more research into it. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like, why aren't we hearing more about this? I think part of that is because previous podcast I did, vendors control school safety, they control the narrative. You can't sell REMS TA at a conference you can, but for a vendor, obviously paying for table space, this would almost kind of be a conflict. But it's 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 just very strange that we don't have more coming out, or we didn't have more coming out about REMS TA. So this new clearinghouse comes forward. Schoolsafety.gov. Does it replace REMS TA? Um, I don't I don't know. Do they live side by side? Um, there's going to be overlap between the two. It makes it more confusing, which is the which is the real clearinghouse, right? Which is the one the government kind of points to and says, here's here's our preferred clearinghouse, which seems it would be schoolsafety.gov because that's the new one. Um, and, you know, rems.ed.gov, it was also a harder to remember website. So there, there are some com components here where I think Yes, have a clearinghouse, but take the existing site REMS. Uh, again, we will we'll, we'll see it. You're, I, I think REMS is very thorough. There are some things that can be done to to update, you know, REMS and maybe schoolsafety.gov. One of the things I think is neither of those sites have a map of the U.S. all 50 states. So if I'm accessing accessing that as an educator or as a parent, like. You know, I could click on my state and I could see, okay, what does Wisconsin require for locking doors during instructional time in schools? 
Is it a mandate? Is it a must? Kentucky, it's a must. You have to do that. In Wisconsin, it's recommended. It's a should. So are we a must or are we a should? So you can go through and, and maybe you could have four or five areas where you could click and see um, across states. So you could specifically see in your state, what is it like for this? Is school safety on our school report card? Yes or no? And what does it look like? Give an example. So um, again, I, I am, I'm very critical of the, the reason schoolsafety.gov came to be, and I'm very um, apprehensive that it is going to erode or cause um, REMS TA to just disappear. So let's take a look at that right now. And I'm going to use a four point rating scale, one through four. So one being poor, two being fair, three being good, and four being great. And I'm going to look at these four areas in the websites. The first, user friendly. What's our first reaction when we get to the site? Can we navigate it? Uh, is it easy to find what we need to find? The second, does it have a relevant menu? Third, is there a clear intended audience? Is this meant for parents? Is it meant for teachers? Is it meant for school leaders, uh, community safety professionals? Is that clearly delineated um, in on the website? And I'm going to also examine the value of the content on the site. So let's begin with the schoolsafety.gov website, which is in front of you. User-friendly, okay. So I don't see a menu, well, about uh, topics. Okay, so I do have a menu here across the top. So that's good. Uh, the print is a little bit small. Just having generic graphics doesn't uh, help me out. Um, so schoolsafety.gov was created by the federal government to provide school districts with actionable recommendations to create a safe and supportive learning environment where students can thrive and grow. That's generic. I don't really know from that statement what the purpose of this site is. Latest news, okay, but I'm not going to probably want that. Um, so as I'm going through, okay, some heading cyberbullying, infectious disease, probably seems like that should be in the CDC. Upcoming opportunities, some trainings, and I'll just keep scrolling down. So user-friendly, I am going to give this a two. Let's go to readiness and emergency management for schools, uh, REMS Technical Assistance Center. Now this has been in existence for several years. I uh, review this in my university courses. This is regularly updated from the Department of Education. Uh, so let's, let's take a look here. We're gonna look at user-friendly. All right, so immediately we have a different interface, more colorful. Um, it's presenting us with some fact sheets. We have a, the menus clear up above, about guidance, resources, tools, and training. So this is laid out a little uh, more thoroughly than, than uh, schoolsafety.gov. And let's keep going down. Okay, so right here's the calendar, what's coming up. Um, best practices, quick links, take an online course, okay. Access an ar archived webinar, read publications, request a virtual training. Looks like here's their mission, prevent, mitigate, protect, respond, recover. Um, gives their phone number right there and also how to contact them. I am going to rate this a four for user friendly. On schoolsafety.gov, we are going to look at the menu and judge how relevant this menu is to school safety. Here we go. So we have a menu up above about, actually when I click there, it takes a little bit. So history, um, was this page helpful? I don't know, probably not, let's put no. So no, no more feedback, boom. Um, and topics, bullying, cyberbullying, cybersecurity, emergency planning, um, nothing really makes these stand out, but let's go to, I guess, targeted violence. Okay, targeted violence. There's a lot of text here. So, okay, here's a, a resource. Um, let's go back to the home page and scroll down here. Okay, so here's a menu. This seems to be too much. Um, Cyberbullying, bullying, emergency planning. This infectious disease, I don't think belongs here. It belongs in the CDC. So 
Um, I am going to say this is kind of a catch all. This seems to be um, too, too much. Uh, but with, with that, it looks like it's, I mean, it's comprehensive. So I'll go with the three. Everything's there, but I think there's too much there. For the REM site, looking at the menu, it is clear up above. Here's uh, K-12 emergency management, resources, um, grant programs, calendar, um, REMS on the air podcast. Okay, that's kind of new, something we didn't see over at schoolsafety.gov. A series here, look at safe school models. So this is pretty interesting, I'm guessing. Yeah, listen here, okay. So that's neat, tools. Um, there's also this, this toolbox where school districts, and K-16 actually can submit resources and then they show up here for other districts to use, other schools to use, so, and training, virtual trainings, and then also live trainings by request. So this is very well laid out for a menu, very, very clear. I'm going to give this a four. Evaluating schoolsafety.gov for intended audience. Is it clear that this website or parts of this website are aimed at teachers, parents, community members, school leaders, is, is that clear? All right, so right here, I don't see anything immediately that indicates this is directed at parents or at teachers. I guess provide schools and districts with actionable recommendations, but again, is this teachers who would be reading this or school administrators? Um, I'm not sure. So let me go through back to school safety resources, download the one pager, let's see. Okay, so first of all, let's look at this. It's small text. Um, there's a lot, oh, there's a lot on here. So from a reading barrier, um, this is going to not be accessible to a lot of people. Um, but okay, so infectious diseases, the rapid, I'm not sure who the, the intended audience is for this. School safety topics, um, data breaches. I maybe I, this. I don't see. I don't know why this would be here. Also, so who is this intended for? Um, national cybersecurity assessments. Let's click. So I mean, it's really your tech person in a district, right? You're not going to do this as a teacher, as a parent. This isn't going to make any sense to you. So, so this website. Um, is schoolsafety.gov doesn't clearly delineate who the intended audience is. So I'm going to give it a one out of four, one uh, or rated poor. Looking at REMS TA, who is the intended audience? Um, so I am reading right here. Download this new fact sheet for K-12 and higher ed practitioners on the purpose, structure, and benefits of after action reports. So it seems like that would be directed at educators. Um, okay, so goals and objectives, analysis of outcome, summary recommendations. Um, okay, kind of, I, it's, it's, not, it's not super clear that that is um, just intended for educators. Uh, I'm going through Here's trainings, so can I participate in this? The role of mental health professionals in school, could I participate in this as a parent? Um, let's see, I'm clicking, it's taking a little while to come up. Um, the role, okay, learn. it looks like I could, so let me just go and click here, but all right, presenters, REMS TA. So one of the things, that right here, REMS does a lot of these trainings, uh, which I believe is an asset, but it doesn't indicate, so it has presenters, but doesn't say who the intended audience is. And that should be right up front. Okay, here's what we're presenting. The intended audience is teachers or it's administrators or administrators and um, uh, school counselors, for example. So it doesn't have that, um, so, I'm going to give this website a two out of four. 
And finally, let's examine the value of the content. Schoolsafety.gov. Okay, find resources to create a safer school. So, all right, let's let's try to do that. Just scrolling down here, uh, these are articles. So I'm not interested so much in those. Um, let's see, emergency planning. Um, let's look at threat assessment and reporting. That's a big part of preventing school violence. Um, identify and address threatening or concerning behaviors before they lead to violence. Okay, so threat assessment, um, there's a lot of text here and it's going to bring up a document, a report. Okay, the U.S. Secret um, Service Analysis of Targeted School Violence, um, which is a terrific document, but this is clearly aimed at uh, whoever's in charge of school safety. So this isn't for the intended audience, isn't teachers, it's not parents, it's whoever's in charge of school safety. So let's get out of here and let's go back to um, the guidance. Enhancing school safety, okay, another Secret Service guide from 2008, yes, that's good. Um, also over on REMS TA, mass attacks in public spaces. Okay, so these are, you know, this is a 36 page report. So there are a lot of reports here. Um, you're not going to read this as an educator. This is going to be a school leader or whoever's in charge of school safety. And frankly, I don't think they're going to come here and try to pull this information. They're going to be getting it from a conference or from their uh, state school safety um, organization that they're a member of. So I'm going to rate the value of this content. Let's see, we have cyberbullying, all this. We don't have trainings, we don't have classes. Okay, that's over in REMS TA. Um, just to put a lot of things out here and a lot of links to other documents, I don't think is very helpful. I'm going to give this a one. I won't. I don't find this helpful as a parent. I don't find this helpful as an educator. And as a school um, leader, I wouldn't find this helpful. Let's examine the value of the content on the REMS website. All right, so we have our fact sheets. These are helpful. Um, maybe talking points, but let, let's get into the meat here of res resources. Um, the biggest one is the jumps out is this toolbox. So coming in here and you can have a wildfire tabletop exercise, right? So you can uh, modify this to uh, be relevant for your school district. So there are a number of tabletop exercises on here. Uh, this is a terrific asset for schools to have this toolbox. That's not available on schoolsafety.gov. And of course, the training, the virtual trainings, the in-person trainings, webinars, online courses, specialized training package. So um, let's look at uh, virtual trainings by request. Train the trainer, so planning for family reunification and resilience for educators, conducting K-12 site assessment with site assess. Um, intended audience, so look at this. So here they do get very precise, school district and school administrators, educators, facility staff. So saying this is for school folks. And again, REMS will come out with their training to your site. And looks like a school behavioral threat assessments, that is a big area that schools struggle with. How to conduct those, um, having turnover and not having uh, new staff inducted into that process. So. This is something, again, uh, the trainings that is not offered by schoolsafety.gov. We didn't find it over on their website, and at least not anywhere close to this depth. So I am giving REMS a four out of four for content. And if we tally up the totals, we have seven out of a possible 16 for schoolsafety.gov, and we have 14 out of a possible 16 for REMS TA. As chaos erupts, torrents of conflicting yet urgent messages gush from media outlets. What is the magnitude of the incident and what should people do to protect themselves? 
Dr. David P. Perodin teaches you how to prevent mental burnout by observing indicators and building a robust member check network. Reporter James David Dixon of the Detroit News proclaims, the velocity of information will empower its readers. Drawing on current events, history, interviews, and scholarship, the velocity of information is an education in the way people react and adapt to change in this fast-spinning world. Never has it been more important to sift facts and stories for truth and meaning. There are teachable moments on every page. By the Velocity of Information, Human Thinking During Chaotic Times. Available from your favorite bookstore or online retailer. Okay, and, and we've just done a side-by-side -side analysis. So you, you were able to see the news site, schoolsafety.gov, and also REMS-TA. And I think immediately it stands out that REMS-TA is more robust, it's current, um, not really anything lacking from that site. Yet that site is not the clearinghouse, right? It's really designated now for schoolsafety.gov. So we, we have these competing clearinghouses. Um, what, what, is this, what does this mean? And even how is schoolsafety.gov going to be communicated out to school districts? Uh, it, it is very strange, again, that we have the creation through this bill of this new school safety clearinghouse. My opinion, Doc's opinion, it was not necessary. Um, Schoolsafety.gov is catchier, it's easier to remember, so maybe REMS could have been rebranded into Schoolsafety.gov and 90% of it brought forward. Again, that addition, I think, of all 50 states, click on my state and you could get, you know, a five things does my state require that schools are lock their doors during instructional time and so forth? I think that would be useful. But otherwise, um, you know, this to me this this was this was not needed. This new clearinghouse um, number two. Okay, number two from this this bill: more mental health dollars to schools. So when I say more, a lot more mental health dollars to school. Now before we get into that. Um, mental health services in school have uh, really taken off in the last 10, year, 10 years. When I was an administrator my first few years, that was unheard of. Nobody was, was doing that. Um, and now it's pretty common in schools for mental health providers to come into the school or the school to have a contract with a third party and students go to that third party site. Um, so we do have this expansion of mental health in schools. But what this bill did was it put a $500 million each, a half billion dollars into school-based mental health services grant program, listen, grant program, and also school-based mental health service professionals demonstration grant, grant and grant, okay. And the reason I'm emphasizing the word grant is a grant um, ends. A grant has a certain amount of time when you hear the word grant, when you apply for grant, I've, I have you know, written several grant applications, been a part of that over the years. Um, it's meant to get the ball rolling. It's not meant to sustain positions. Grants are meant to end. So this also is not a demonstration of recurring uh, funding. And I don't know if doing more of the same thing gets us further down the road. So again, this is this is where we're at. This is where we're at. Expanding, um, you know, these these mental health services. Okay, as we begin to understand the context around mental health services in schools, we need to go back to 2015, March 3rd, 2015. The Mental Health in Schools Act um, bill was proposed, and that had funding, staff development train family members, it would expand evidence-based mental health programs, so finding a baseline, uh, monitoring um, students, youth who participate in that to find out what worked, what didn't, as far as like measurable variables that you would have a baseline and a change from baseline. So the bill was supported, it was never enacted. So again, this mental health legislation, Mental Health in Schools Act in 2015. So that's still not a part of the game. That's not happening. So this bill gets passed.
passed here, um, you know, the summer for bipartisan safer communities bill, but it does nothing to try to bring along this mental health legislation um, from 2015, which was a solid bill. I had gone through that in my PBS presentation. And the problem with putting a billion dollars more grant funding into mental health for schools and not having this type of legislation that has a framework for um, recurring funding, staff development, getting family members trained, and then also evidence-based mental health programs is you're going to give dollars to districts and they're not going to know exactly what to do with them. You know, here's a mental health provider we can contract with in the community or we can have more counselors. But what programs, like what programs work? Is it that you're going to have um, students who receive, okay, if they're exhibiting whatever mental health need, anxiety, anger, depression, we now have them able to enroll in an eight session program. Well, what does that mean after eight sessions? is you've completed it. What if you still have needs after eight sessions? Do you get to continue or not? So by not passing the Mental Health Legislation um, Act or having some form of it brought into this bill, what has happened is we've just pushed a billion dollars into schools for additional mental health services in grants and my opinion is a lot of those will not be spent wisely and we will not know the outcomes of those services i think that's probably the biggest thing here is we're not going to know if it really made a difference at all um, because again we are not measuring this from the scientific model we are not finding baseline and change from baseline if you do a survey in some districts i've seen they, they do this you know does a student report that they feel more positive about what they're doing or less anxious or things like this. Um, you know, those, again, are extremely vague, extremely um, subjective. And the ment what we need to do is we need to have, you know, a, a third party, you know, researchers come into this, pairing up with universities, for example, and making this a research project where programs are very thoroughly assessed and then the impact on academics, um, the impact on um, acts of, of violent, uh, violence, uh, maybe some admission to a hospital uh, for depression, whatever it is, all of, all of these could be put together and could be studied on a longitud longitudinal basis, didn't happen. So, all right, so one, we talked about these the, this new website, which was created, this clearinghouse, now we're talking about a billion dollars more into mental health grants into schools. Now, here's something else, okay? By just believing we're going to put a billion dollars out there and schools will have these services is extremely naive. Um, and here's one of the reasons uh, for that. There's an extreme shortage of mental health providers, and it's not uh, being fixed by more money, just actually educators. The Des Moines Public Schools this summer have offered a $50,000 bonus to teachers who were planning to retire. But they said, hey, if you work another year, we'll give you $50,000. Some of the teachers took up that offer, but this is happening all over. Not necessarily $50,000, but these big recruitment bonuses. Where I live, the our state capital a big county right next to me um, still had 600 teaching vacancies and it pays uh, very well for our area and yet 600 teaching vacancies. Going back to my PBS presentation 2019, this slide, shortage of providers, Chris Mueller, Appleton Post Crescent, May 22nd, 2019, newspaper um, indicated that, quote, the wait for an appointment for a child could be weeks or months, and that was in regard to getting a mental health appointment with a provider. Um, Wisconsin, where in 2019 had 148 practicing child psychiatrists, that was only 12 per 100,000 residents younger than age 18. So the fact that this money is going to come out there, somebody will uh, you know, sponge up this money like that. It won't be un, not it won't be unencumbered, right? It will be spent. 
but you're not going to get more mental health providers. It just isn't going to happen. The money has been there already with grants to do that. People know if they come out that they these positions um, are are out there, right? Uh, mental mental health, they're going to get a job. But just overall, again, look at the job market. Look at this is not a field that uh, people are are going into. Um, and it's it's also very narrow. I mean, we look at mental health dollars. There is there's so much I believe that could could be um, elevated by putting more dollars into nursing in schools, nursing services, um, and we don't see see that. So we kind of are, are funding into mental health. But again, if we have, I would say, nursing uh, services, it's. It's kind of like, you know, why do we have this and, and not have this? And there has not been this strong um, correlation between mental health services and, and better student academic performance. People will tell you that, but the problem is they're not going to um, be able to show you the, the, the data on that, right? The real scientific research data. So here's some things with student mental health again. There's questions. Who evaluates? Uh, typically, school staff aren't licensed to evaluate for mental health. Who qualifies for services? Is it worst is first? Some principals have told me that. Uh, what's the best treatment? How do they match a treatment to the student? How do you measure progress, right? Is it that you completed eight sessions or some baseline and change? And what's your discharge criteria? So all these things have to be, have to be worked through. Um, but again, so we have a billion dollars going into mental health in schools. Maybe, you know, there'll be uh, more counselors, but it, you're, you, these mental health providers just do not exist in communities. They'd have to also go through extensive, you know, programs to be trained. And anytime you see the word grant, people are going to be very cautious about taking a position that is a grant position because it's temporary at some point right that won't be there that's where that mental health and schools act of 2015 had recurring funding um, so there's just a lot of things which look knee-jerk right here um, this will come into you know this this will definitely flood into schools is it going to make schools um, safer i don't think you can say that i don't think you can measure that this has made schools that this will make schools um, safer and again if we go back to recent or even you know long-term individual school shootings uh, for example or school violence is the fact that we have mental health services um, how does that correlate has that has that been studied for example it has has a student that received mental health services during their time in school gone on to commit an act of violence against the school so i think these are areas we need to to get into and really kind of study and understand um, so, and let's look down to number three. So our first one, we have this new clearinghouse, schoolsafety.gov. Second, more mental health dollars to schools. Um, and by the way, if you're a rural school district, and in my state, we have 421 school districts and a number of them are rural, like a thousand students or less, and also in very sparsely pop populated areas of the state. Very difficult to um, have any type of services outside of maybe some teletherapy, but then you know everybody's like, oh, teletherapy, which can be effective, but then where are these therapists, right, who are going to to do this? You know, we again, we if we back out of this, we go to other professions. You know, pharmacists. There's a shortage of you know pharmacists. There's a shortage of nurses. You know, where they're paying a thousand dollars a shift. There's a shortage of. I mean, we can go on and on. Um, and especially when you get into rural settings, those typically all those shortages are exacerbated in rural settings. Um, so let's go on to another area, and this is expand access to juvenile mental health records. I don't know what this exactly means. Um, I'll tell you what I what I think it means, what how I think it will be approached, and also how I think schools will respond to it. But um, so basically, saying well, if we have access okay here's a here's a student 17 or 18 who you know um was a school shooter and you know it seems like the fbi has known for some of these shooters right that they've been on they've been previously reported to the fbi or or police agencies but um but what they're saying here is we can 
we can now have access to maybe some of the school's behavior records for students or maybe some of their medical records that previously um, would have been out of limits, right? Uh, part of that is FERPA, the Family Education Rights and Privacy in Schools, uh, limiting access for outside agencies. Also, um, IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Education Act, if a student has an emotional behavioral disability, for example, and an IEP, their records would be protected under IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Education Act. So this isn't clear. This will be, these processes will be written, developed, but um, so I'm trying to imagine, right, that what would bring a, a police uh, officer, right, or Department of Homeland Security or whatever, uh, to contact a school and say, we need the student records for John Smith, right? What does the school provide? They're going to probably immediately contact their lawyer. With a, and this will be happening right now. Lawyers will be advising schools. If you get contacted by the police or you know, some agency about student records, here's what we think your response should be, either to deny or to request like a certain whatever, um, you know, delineation of exactly the time frame and, and what records you want. Um, a must read for parents, teachers, and taxpayers. Dr. David Perodin has written the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industrial complex. Attorney James Sibley proclaims, a brave demonstration of speaking truth to power. School of Errors rips the lid off the billion dollar school safety industry. Using real-world examples of successful responses in desperate situations, David contrasts the expensive window dressings pitched to panic parents with the inexpensive and effective approaches proven to actually work. Read this book before you let your school waste another precious dollar on meaningless safety theater. Buy the international bestseller, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America, now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. But this is, this is a can of worms. This is brand new. Um, this isn't what schools are used to. Now, there's something else at play here, and that's called an abeyance agreement. Now, I wrote an article that will be featured in Phi Delta Kappen Journal um, yet this year about abeyance agreements. And let me just give you an overview of those. So school suspensions, right? So if, if you suspend a student for a week, they're out of school five days, that gets reported to the uh, states, gets reported to the federal government office of civil rights. Um, and that's really frowned upon after the 2014 um, Dear Colleague letter uh, from the Obama administration to schools saying, you know, suspension, please do what you can to curb suspensions, but more not please, like you need to curb suspensions. This data needs, these numbers need to decrease. So what schools did, now they won't tell you they did this. I wrote about this extensively in this, this article, it's well cited, but largely dis um, discipline resulting in suspensions dropped. You can look across the country and suspension data looks amazing right now, fewer suspensions. Um, sometimes cut in half, but are schools safer? Are, are students being less violent, less instances of, of violent, egregious acts? And teachers will tell you no, right? Um, and my staff would say, my, my students would say the same thing. Um, so what happens, one of the avenues is it's called an abeyance agreement. And it's basically a suspended or a stayed suspension. So an abeyance agreement is saying, okay, as long as you don't do this again, uh, make this threatening note or this threatening statement or whatever, as long as you don't do it again for one quarter, um, we'll wipe it off your record. There's no consequence right now. You're not going to be out of school, but we're not going to go to suspension. And abeyance agreements are crazy um, all over the place. Now, this is something that doesn't exist in educational law. It's nowhere in educational law. Board of Education policies bring these things to be, and school lawyers will back them, saying, "Oh, it's a it's a tool of discretion for an administrator to right or wrong." 
to address disproportionality, uh, possibly. But um, but no, what an abeyance agreement does is it creates a situation where there is not a reportable record. So there's no record, there's no documentation. Nobody receives notice of an abeyance agreement. The states, the feds, they don't know about it. So if somebody goes to the school and says, you know, we have concerns of the student is saying, you know, he's going to, he's been threatening his family and threatening community and, um, and they want the school behavior records, the school might have very legitimate concerns about the student, but they've chosen to not use a, a reportable um, documentation tool such as a suspension. They've chosen because, again, they get dinged from the state and dinged from the feds, and it's not a good thing. Schools know, right, if you have high suspension numbers, you can end up with uh, the investigation from Office of Civil Rights, you know, on your practices. And just look at the uh, Oklahoma City and um, City uh, Oakland, California, for example, and, and there are others. But uh, anyway, um, uh, law enforcement might come in and, and ask for records and you'd say, we don't have them, right? We, do, we don't have, you wouldn't give them records because this abeyance agreement technically doesn't exist. After 90 days, poof, it's gone, it vanishes. So if I'm a school district and with my legal counsel, this is going to be coming up, right? Of Are we moving toward more abeyance agreements to keep these these things off the books? Because what if, you know, some of this is being looked at and what if there is going to be some profiling of students? Now, I'm not saying like I believe this will happen and taking a kind of a position on either side. I'm just saying objectively from what I see and from writing you know, this this um, feature article about abeyance agreements, I think schools are going to, to really examine how they're documenting discipline, especially for high school students, knowing that those records um, through this bill, right, can be accessed. And, and it's not clear how they're accessed, how they're used. Schools have a very they're very protective of these these records and and now there's this easement through this bill um and and what you know vulnerability that opens up or will the school then have some liability if a student does something and you know the the outside agency you know department of homeland security police whatever look at this and say oh my goodness like these things are happening and so school what did you do or during discovery in a legal case like school you knew about these things what did you do so this is this is also an area that is not going to um, be smoothly received between schools and law enforcement. This will be a friction point. Schools are going to get legal uh, guidance on this from their their uh, attorneys. It's going to be different from district to district. And I just don't see I don't see this as as making a difference. Um, I, I just, I really, I really don't. Again, we go back and it's, it seems that law enforcement already had ample inf information from parents, from, uh, you know, calls to, to 911 about their, their children to be able to have a, a mosaic um, to inform them. Uh, if you have this information, expanding these, the, uh, mental health records, then a pen, potentially you're going to deny the purchase of a of a gun. But what if you know the gun's not obtained like legally? Or again, how are you going to? I mean, there's there's also a part in here of if a student where where's your interpretation, the subjectiveness of a student has um, ADD, right? Uh, or, uh, they're taking Ritalin, or at some point they received counseling services for this million, million or billion dollars going into schools for mental health. What if they received some mental health services for anxiety or anger and that was two years ago and now that record is there, does that disqualify them from being able to purchase a gun? So this is very murky. Um, so again, you know, so we have this website, this clearinghouse, schoolsafety.gov, which was created, which I believe did not need to be created. REMS TA was the clearinghouse. If anything, um, that could have been refined. It was all, it was already very, very good. Um, 
more mental health dollars to schools, a billion dollars, but it's coming in the form of grants, and it did not get coupled to that mental health legislation from 2015, which would have outlined the research model, which you need. What was your What's your baseline? What are we measuring? And what's our change from baseline so we know what worked and what didn't work? That's not there, just money coming into the system. We talked about, hey, like Des Moines, Iowa, just for teachers paying $50,000 bonuses if you stick around a year. So the fact of pump, pumping more money into the system and thinking that's going to um, increase school safety, I don't, and how are you gonna measure that? I don't know. Expanding this access to juvenile mental records is very fuzzy. And this is also like, it kind of has this contradiction point with the previous part of a billion dollars for mental health. Um, I've had parents who have said, I don't know if I want my child to have this this uh, mental health service in the school, maybe you know for anxiety or for or depression, and because now it'll create a record, and maybe down the road if they're applying for a job or into the military or whatever, like they'll look back and say you have this. Parents have those concerns; they bring those up. Um, so let's look at some glaring oversights from this bill. When I talk about this bill, again, it's the Bipartisan Safer Communities Bill that was passed this summer. Um, Glaring oversights, locked doors in schools and regulated devices. Those I think are are two of the, the big ones right up front here. So we have one state that requires that schools must lock doors during instructional time. That state is Kentucky. That was passed in 2020. Kentucky also has a marshal that randomly goes out to districts and does audits. So if you don't have your door locked, you can have a consequence for that. That happens. Other states have updated their legislation. Um, Four or five states, Florida, Wisconsin, uh, Massachusetts, um, and it's strongly recommending, right, that you lock doors, but they do not have mandates that doors be locked. So you're going to see a lot of the should, should lock doors. And that then carries over into Board of Education policies and into handbooks, should lock doors. Why is it should lock doors? Because, right, legally, um, you're less, the the thought is you'd be less liable if it's should lock doors than, than must. And then also must lock doors what are what are you doing for consequence of a teacher two times doesn't lock a door versus versus a should so there's there's this logically right it seems that must would be be the requirement that why don't we have must um so we go back to um you know like uvalde um you know texas we go to the rob elementary school shooting that ended the lives of 19 students and two teachers on May 24th, 2022. You know, we have a we have a district as many that has a should lock doors um, practice, right? It's either a board of education policy or it's a procedure in a school, but you know, that's what it is. Uvalde's not alone. That is most schools throughout because they do not require this in the state laws. Again, Kentucky does. Um, so it's a glaring oversight from this bill. Now, you know, we, we could say, well, a federal bill can't mandate that the states do that. True, but um, just like, you know, the federal funding that went out for transportation, that drinking age, right? If it wasn't, if it wasn't 21, you weren't going to get the funding. Um, there could have been something tied into this with the mental health funding or, or whatever of saying, you're not going to get the full funding unless you also require that schools lock their doors. And I don't see, actually in Kentucky, there was quite a bit of opposition to this. Administrators, teachers going forward as saying, you know, it messes up our our air circulation in the buildings. They get hotter or colder because doors are closed or it's, it's inconvenient, right? Um, with kindergartners having to go to the bathroom, you gotta unlock the door there, they have to knock and have to let them back and stuff like that. They're all inconveniences, right? But these it should be absolutely a non-negotiable that doors are locked. And I don't see that there would be huge opposition to this at a state level, especially if your Department of Justice at the state just said, here's what we're doing. You're, it's going to be must lock doors. And we are going to have random audits um, through the, you know, or, or you know, local law enforcement, just like fire departments come in and, and do their walk through. 
are going to, to do this. So anyway, that's a missed opportunity. And I think it also shows how incomplete this bill was when it got to the school safety side of the, of the funding of, of putting stuff together. So the whole locked door thing doesn't make doesn't make sense to me. Um, why again? It's a should and not a must. Um, and then also regulated devices, safety devices. Vendors are going crazy right now, selling everything to schools. Um, so why don't we have a underwriter's laboratory or some heightened requirement that these vendors for whether it be phone apps or door barricades or locks or whatever have to show um, their research and also have to you know maybe have a, a bond some level of insurance and then also be able to show how they they did their trials and pilots and that this would be then submitted to i don't know maybe like the state before it would be approved there there would be some way to do this right think of an underwriter's laboratory but for school safety but nothing like that um, came out of this. So we have vendors going absolutely bananas now because there is a ton of money out there. Um, so again, bulletproof windows, bollards, and surveillance cameras. I think um, Uvalde, I read an article this morning, I believe it was 500 new surveillance cameras. Cameras were not the issue at Uvalde. Cameras were not the issue at all, right? So you look at this and it's like, okay, but if we forensically go back into these situations, it was a matter of discretion um, who had discretion to take out the, the um, assailant, right, the intruder, um, and then also reporting what was reported and then also that um, there was action that was able to be taken upon the reporting of the, the previous instance that this uh, person had of making threats. So this is, this is not going to make schools... Um, safer. It's a move toward fortification. And uh, so anyway, thank you so much. This is episode 182 of the Safety Doc podcast. Check out the Velocity of Information, um, the book about uh, really what happens during um, extended periods of chaos. What happens to all of us when we get to 90 days? We kind of hit this fuse, this finite voltage. How can you diffuse that? There's 12 ways. How can you see it in others, including your kids and help them work their way through time versus getting stuck um, in time and kind of spinning. Uh, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety, the most honest book written about the $3 billion school safety industry, $20 also now available in audiobook, uh, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America. Thank you, everybody, and um, take care and stay safe. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perot. Remember to check back each week for the latest, best, and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. You can find Dr. Perot on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.